These are European dewberry, Rubus caseus. It's a fruit that I find most people don't know about in the UK. They usually mistake them for slightly misshapen blackberries. They are very similar to blackberries, but they have fewer droplets, and the droplets are larger and not symmetrical. They're a deeper purple colour than blackberries, and they're usually covered in a whitish bloom that can give the fruits a bluish appearance. And they also usually ripen slightly earlier than blackberries. Another good indicator for dewberry is its growing pattern. It's more of a low growing, spreading plant than brambles. Brambles can grow quite high on long arching stems, but you see the dewberries kind of don't really grow more than a few feet off the ground. and the leaves are usually divided into three leaflets. They've got a taste fairly similar to blackberry and I'd use them in pretty much the same way as blackberry. They're a bit juicier and maybe a slightly tartar flavour but I actually prefer dewberries when they're fully ripe to blackberries. They're quite difficult to pick as well, by the way. When they're perfectly ripe, they're usually quite easily squished. This is sea radish, an edible plant in the mustard family. It's very common all around the UK coasts and estuaries. If you find it inland, then it's probably wild radish which is almost identical looking and also edible. Sea radish is easier to identify in winter and early spring with its new growth and its young leaves are at their best edible stage in winter. But in July you can harvest these, the sea radish seed pods. They're quite distinctive looking seed pods. They look like beads and it's usually two or three beads in a pod. Although you do sometimes get just the one. And at the end of the seed pod, you've got a beaked tip. They've got a nice peppery taste. They taste just like the radish roots that you can buy in the shop. They're good eaten raw. I like them chucked into a stir fry and they're also really good pickled. And as you can see, you get absolutely thousands on a single plant. Just make sure you pick the pods when they're a nice bright green colour like this when they're immature. Because if you pick them when they start to go like a dark yellowy brown colour when they've matured, the seeds inside can be really hard and you'll probably damage your teeth. As you can see, the flowers are yellow and they have four petals in a cruciform or in a cross. It's a good indicator of the mustard family. I'll do a more in-depth identification of this plant in the winter when it's easier to identify because most of the leaves have died back now and that's the easiest way to identify a sea radish or a wild radish. But you're unlikely to mistake this plant for anything else apart from a member of the mustard family. The quickest and easiest way I've found of harvesting the seed pods is to grab a stem between your thumb and finger and just strip them off.
This is mugwort, Artemisia vulgaris, an edible plant from the daisy family that usually grows to around one and a half meters. So it's traditionally used for flavoring ale before hops became more commonly used. You'll find it along roadsides in bits of waste ground like this. It's a plant that likes to grow around human habitation. Its leaves lower down are divided and look quite fern-like. They're darker green on top and silvery white underneath. As you move higher up the plant, the leaves become much narrower. And at the top, you get leaves in between the flower buds and they're much thinner. The mugwort has strongly aromatic leaves. When you crush them, you'll get a strong musky smell with a hint of lavender. The stems are upright and grooved and they often have quite a reddish purpley tinge. The flower buds grow in dense clusters and they're white with green stripes. I mostly like to use this plant as an aromatic herb. The leaves and flower buds can be used fresh or dried in a similar way to rosemary. So they're good for flavoring soups or stirred through boiled rice to infuse the flavor. The flower buds are especially good for making a tea that aids digestion. And the stems can be peeled and eaten as a vegetable, though they do go a bit tough once the plant goes into flower. A few points of caution with this plant. I've read several reports saying this plant should not be consumed during pregnancy. Apparently it can cause early contractions. And also be aware that the lower down leaves can look fairly similar to the deadly poisonous monk's hood. Though monk's hood doesn't have the silvery underside to the leaf. And once the plants are both in flower, there's no mistake in them then. This is the patch of fennel that I showed you back in May. Now this time of year, the stems will be way too woody and tough to eat. You may get lucky and find some leaves that are still in a good enough condition to eat. But this time of year, what we're after is the pollen. It can take quite a while to collect, even a small amount, but it's totally worth it because it's a really nice ingredient. So you want to make sure the flowers are bright yellow and open. You see like this here, they're not quite open yet, so you won't really get any pollen from them. The one behind it here is really nice and bright yellow. You can see most of the flowers there are open. That's the one that you want to go for. So there's a couple of ways you can collect it. You can just get like a jar and tip the heads over and tip, tap them uh, and collect the pollen that way. It takes a really long time and you need a really big patch of uh, fennel to be able to collect it like that. Another way is just to take off a head like this and place it into a, like a paper bag or a jar and just collect up a good 10 or 15 heads that way. Just leave them for a couple of days and let the pollen fall out and you get a lot more that way. Just keep in mind, if you do it this way, you won't be getting seeds later in the year. So don't collect all of the flower heads, leave a good amount of them to go to seed. You can see the bright yellow ones really stand out. And the smell is unmistakable as well. And the flowers are releasing their pollen you get that really strong aniseed smell. The pollen has a more subtle and complex flavor than the rest of the plant. Its anise flavor is backed by citrus notes. 
It works really well mixed with olive oil and rubbed into meat or fish or stirred through grilled vegetables. Also try blanching sugar snap peas and sprinkling a small amount of pollen on top. It can also be used with sweet dishes just like dusting on ice cream. You don't need to use much, you just want to use it as a background flavour. This is Salad Burnett, Sanguisorba Minor, an edible herb in the rose family. It can be found in most types of grasslands, but it prefers chalky, well-drained soil and it needs full sun. Its leaves have up to 12 pairs of opposing leaflets and one terminal leaf. The leaflets are oval and toothed and the leaves give off a faint cucumber smell when crushed. The young leaves are a good salad herb. They've got a nice cooling cucumber flavour. They're best before the plant flowers so they can go a bit bitter then. I also like to use them instead of cucumber in a raita or you can use them in summery drinks like pims. The leaves are also good for treating sunburn. If you just infuse the leaves into hot water like you're making a tea and then allow it to cool and apply the liquid to the burn area, it has a nice cooling soothing effect. The salad burnet is one of those plants you can quite easily miss. It's not until you stop and really look that you'll notice that it can be grown all the way through the grass. 